We so often want it now. And I'm not just talking about the things of this world. I'm talking about spiritually. We, uh, when we come to Christ, we, we want salvation. We want heaven. We want it now. We want all the benefits, all the blessings of what he heaven is going to bring us, and we want to enjoy it right now. We don't want to have to wait. We don't have to work for it. We just want it now. This is the life that we tend to live, and I think especially in America, we've got this problem, and the problem is this. Because we can't have all of the blessings of heaven now, we have begun to substitute the eternal heavenly blessings for earthly blessings. And we've begun to say that actually equate the earthly blessings that this world has to offer as the blessings of heaven. That what we even are looking forward to when we get to heaven is now focused on the blessings of this world instead of the blessings of heaven. In 1 Corinthians, the Corinthian church was experiencing the same kind of reality. They had the same perspective. that They, they had seen the Christianity. They saw it as a, ends, uh, as an in, uh, as a means to an end. They, they saw it as the way for them to get and enjoy blessings. They, they thought, you know, if, if I just give my life to Christ, then God is going to just dump all these blessings on me and I get to enjoy them right now. Get to enjoy all that he has for me right now and right here. Certainly in our culture today, we have uh, people who are going around preaching these messages, this reality that, that you don't have to wait for heaven, that the blessings are all right now, right before you, that he wants you to be wealthy, he wants you to have those amazing, awesome cars and the big houses, and he wants you to have all the things that you've ever dreamed about, and he wants to give it to you right now. But this is a substitute for what is really coming to us in eternity. Corinthians have fallen into this trap. They were seeking heavenly blessings, but they were basically elevating the earthly blessings and saying that, no, 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 these, these actually are the heavenly blessings. So Paul uh, kind of confronts them on this in Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians. So let me read that for you. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not se seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas, who lack the right to not work for a living? Who serves, a soldier at his, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and doesn't drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because whoever plows and thresses should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did this. But we did not, excuse me, use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. And I am not writing this in hope that you will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. 
If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul shares in this passage uh, an example from his own life that, that, that he, as a preacher of the gospel, has the right to expect that those he preaches to would support him, would care for him, would give him a monetary, some kind of monetary value so that he could have a place to stay, that he could have food to eat, that he could have money to be able to you know, provide whatever he needed for to get through the day. He had this right... But he uses this as an example. He says, but, but I have not claimed the right. I have not demanded the right. I have sacrificed that right. And why did he sacrifice it? He sacrificed it so that he might win a few. That he might bring some to salvation. You know, so often we look at Paul and his extreme statements here of him becoming all things to all people, and we, we can kind of put him out in this corner and say, well, Paul is just, he's just this guy that's kind of a stranger, and he's, he's out there, to, he's out to learn, he's kind of extreme. But see, Paul is not writing this passage in order to say, hey, here's an example from my life. You don't have to do this, but, you know, here's just, you know, he's not trying to make some extreme example of, for, for you to recognize and to, you know, to, to, to understand what he's trying to say. The reality is he's saying, no, 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 you are to follow me in this. It's not just an example. He's not just an example. He's to be followed. The reality is he's saying is that we should all be willing to give up our rights in order to bring some to the kingdom of God. We in the American church today have the same perspective that the Corinthians do, that Christianity is about blessing. That, it's, it's, that, that you know, when we come to Christ, it's, you know, so often we come to Christ because we, we're thinking about all the good things we're going to get. You know, not just heaven, but also the good things here. That, you know, God's going to restore my relationships. That God's going to take care of me and he's going to provide all my needs. That he's going to give me that good house. He's going to give me that car. Even if you don't have an extreme perspective, a health and wealth perspective, that God's going to dump all of this on you, you still have this sense that, you know, that God is, my life is going to be better when I become a Christian. That I'm going to experience more blessings once I become a Christian. And we begin to equate the earthly blessings as signs that God is pleased with us. 
of signs that, you know, we must be doing the right thing, that, that we're living our life right because we keep having these positive and good things that happen to us, that, that we get the promotion at work, that, that we're not one of the ones that gets laid off, that, you know, we, you know, have a healthy family, that we have, you know, good relationships or the relationships get restored. Well, it's because I'm such a good Christian or because I've been following God. The reality is we begin to maybe see our Christian life in this way, and I, I think a, a current vision of a successful Christian life would be similar to the one, uh, to, it would be similar to the story of Anne. Anne grew up in the church, and except for a short time of backsliding during her college years, she always sought to live a good life. Her parents were good people who attended church two or three times a month and lived as best they could in accordance with their understanding of God's Word. Anne, as a child, loved going to church, but it wasn't until middle school when she finally gave her life to Jesus. Her early teen years were filled with friendship, drama, and the church youth group became a refuge from the tensions. God's promise of unconditional love was extremely attractive, and one Sunday, she silently prayed to receive Jesus. Her life did not immediately change, and to some extent, she was disappointed by how the drama continued and how she didn't feel much different. But she assumed that receiving God's love and blessing must be something that doesn't come easy and that she'd have to work for it. So she chose to be patient and made church and Jesus a priority in her life. In her mid-twenties, she met and began to date Jeff. He was a strong Christian and was very involved in church, which was a big reason why Anne was attracted to him and why she eventually, after three years of dating, married him. He was a pastor's kid who for a while thought about following in his dad's footsteps, but after seeing how some in the church had treated his parents, he swore he'd never do it. Their marriage was certainly hard at times, especially in the first couple years as they learned to do life as a couple instead of as individuals. But their early struggles soon gave way to deeper love and a bigger family. The birth of Layla brought new life and great joy to their home. Jeff's dental practice had strengthened to the point that Anne was able to quit her job and fulfill her dream of being a stay-at-home mom. A couple years later, Austin arrived, and although his breech birth Whoa, lost my spot there. Woo. Although his breech birth was much more traumatic than Layla's, other than Anne having to stay in the hospital for a couple extra days, everything was great. Their little family was happy, healthy, and safe. Anne felt like her years of patience and hard work for the Lord were finally starting to pay off. She was feeling more and more love from God and was experiencing great joy and happiness. When Layla was old enough to attend school, Anne and Jeff had long debates over whether to send her to private Christian school. They spent much, of pr much time in prayer together and seeking wisdom from their Christian friends and even talked to their pastor. Jeff was worried about the cost, but Anne's concern for their children's spiritual condition eventually won out. Austin joined his sister at the Christian school a couple years later, and Anne found a part-time job to help make ends meet. Life for Anne and Jeff settled into a sweet routine. They both got up fairly early and began each day with a time of prayer. Jeff then would head to the office while Anne helped the kids get ready for school. As she dropped them off at the front door, she'd hand each of them their sack lunch filled with a healthy meal and a note of encouragement. Anne met a couple days a week with several friends for coffee and prayer. They had been meeting for years and had developed a very close accountability relationship. Stacy and Maggie both attended the same church as Anne, but Lynn and her husband, about a year earlier, had left their church. They had a conflict with one of the elders, and after a brief attempt to resolve the issue, they quietly started attending elsewhere. In the evenings, Anne put her cooking skills to work, and most nights they had dinner together as a family at the table. They maintained a strict no-cell-phone-at-the-table policy and enjoyed wonderful conversations as each person shared the blessings and the struggles of the day. But on Wednesdays, Anne and Jeff dropped their kids off at the local Awanas program so that they could attend one of their church's growth groups. After three years, they had grown very close with the other couples in the group. They dug, into deep, dug deep into God's Word and had challenging conversations about how to apply its truth to their lives. Anne and Jeff were very committed to their church. On Sundays, they served once a month as greeters, and Anne volunteered to bring snacks for after-service fellowship regularly. They often brought a couple bags of food for the local shelter, and Jeff even used his dental skills on the short-term mission trip to Mexico one year. 
Anne listens intently to the message each week and loves how the pastor makes it so practical. She always takes detailed notes and especially highlights the parts of the message that really resonate with her. She desires to know God better and humbly looks for ways for, to show more love to Jeff and the kids. After church, they usually spend the afternoon doing lunch with either her parents or Jeff's, and Sunday evenings are set aside for rest and usually a movie or a couple episodes of their favorite TV show on Netflix. To this day, Anne spends her life striving to live for Jesus. She sacrifices many hours each day, spending time with and talking about God. She works hard to be obedient and to serve and care for those in her life. She often feels a sense of pride over the success of her, of her life, but is sure to give God all the credit. She knows God has blessed her because of her devotion to Him. Each night, as Anne pulls the covers up to her chin and rests her head on the soft down pillow, she quietly gives thanks to God for, her, for His abundant provision. She even prays for those less fortunate than she. Her prayer often goes something like this, Lord, provide for those who have less than I do. For those sleeping on the street tonight, reveal the deceptions of drugs, anger, and despair. May they come to pursue and enjoy the depth of your love and provision like I have. Amen. As I read Anne's story, perhaps there were parts of it that you connected with in the sense that, oh yeah, I've experienced that or am experiencing that right now. And, and, and maybe it brought up uh, feelings of joy and happiness, the, the, the beauty of being able to live out the Christian life and the blessings that come with it. Uh, maybe others of you uh, have not experienced those things and maybe you're at the end of your life and you're wishing that you would have experienced those and you're sad that you missed out on some of those times with your kids and sweet times of conversation and developing those conversations about God. But maybe uh, you're still looking back and, and, and or still looking forward and going, maybe that's going to be my life. That's maybe what I'm hoping for in the future someday. That that, that that would be awesome if my life could be similar to Anne's, to have that kind of blessing, to, to have that kind of relationship with God. And certainly in Anne's life, there's a lot of good things. Her times in prayer and Bible study, times of accountability relationships and developing those relationships with others, times in church and, and doing service and ministry for others. So they're all good things and sweet things, but there's also some problems with Anne's perspective. She's equating earthly blessing with spiritual success. She's come to believe that if she's getting good things in this world, if she's getting blessed with the earthly blessings of a nice house, of kids that are healthy, of, of you know, a new job, of all of that, of being able to have a church that she can you know, be inter interact with and have healthy relationships in, then she sees all of those things as a sign of her spiritual success. That God is smiling down on her because of that. That God is blessing her through those earthly pleasures. And maybe, in part, He is. But it's dangerous to begin to equate those things together. But perhaps the biggest concern is her content, her contentment with pseudo sacrifice. She, she talks about how she sacrificed for God and how she gives up hours of her day in order to spend time with Him and with talking about Him with others. But the reality is, is that really a sacrifice? So many of us in America. In the American church, we look at sacrifice as uh, giving of our excess. That, that you know, if we have uh, a, a, an extra bonus that comes in at the end of the year and we give a portion of that to the church, that, boy, we really sacrificed. Or maybe we gave the whole bonus to the church. Boy, didn't we really sacrifice? We, we, we think that if, you know, we go on a short-term mission for a week or two, that that's a boy. We really went and sacrificed and went and had to, you know, spend a lot of time in these, you know, uh, horrible conditions and, you know, laying on the ground and, and, and at really hot temperatures. And see, see we, we often equate sacrifice with our excess. But real sacrifice will always cost us something. It will be painful. See, the reality is, is uh, we in American Christian culture 
think that Christianity is about blessing. But in Scripture, it tells us a very different story. It, it suggests that Christianity is about sacrifice. Consider the life of Paul. I mean, how many of us in this room, I ask this question, how many of us in the room, if you, if you consider the life of Paul, if you were to, to look at all that he's accomplished, all that he did, everything that he's experienced, and, and not know, I mean, if someone was to tell you the story of Paul but not tell you that it was the Bible, Paul, would you go, oh, man, that guy's a really good Christian. Boy, that guy's really being blessed by God. I don't think any of us here would. We perhaps would respond in a similar perspective as we, if we heard a story about a guy named Ken. Ken was born in a very, diff, a very affluent family with strong ties to the political establishment in Washington, D.C. He was raised in private schools and was an excellent student who excelled in law. His wealth and academic success gave him great confidence and brash arrogance. In high school, his dad made regular trips to the principal's office to defend his son's condescending outbursts directed at his teachers. Ken was accepted into Harvard. A couple years later, got into Harvard School of Law. And four years after that, graduated with the Master's of Laws degree. His father pulled some strings and got him in, uh, in as an associate in a prestigious legal firm in New Jersey. He once again excelled and three years later was offered and accepted a partnership in that same firm. Just after receiving his partnership, he fell in love with Julie. Julie was a beautiful young woman who had also grown up in a wealthy family. She spent several years in the modeling field but was never able to really make it work. She and Ken met at a five-star restaurant where she worked as lead hostess. Ken was a regular com uh, was a regular, coming in a couple of times a week with his fellow partners and high-end clients. Julie's mom had taught her how to recognize and gain the attention of the rich, the powerful, and the available. She spotted Ken immediately, and within two weeks, they were officially dating. A few months later, they were engaged, and on the anniversary of their meeting, they tied the knot. Their marriage was passionate, volatile, and convenient. Ken's large salary allowed Julie to live the lifestyle she had grown accustomed to, and her beauty kept Ken in the tabloids, which continued to build his popularity and his portfolio. After 10 years, he was one of the top lawyers in, at his firm and was enjoying tremendous success in every aspect of life. Until one day, while driving his Ferrari through the winding roads in the country, he lost control. His car rolled four times, and it nearly killed him. He would spend the next three months in the hospital, a third of that time unconscious. When he finally came to and got over the first couple days of grogginess, he began to tell everyone about how he'd met Jesus. Ken had never been a religious man. Although he'd been to church many times, he never would have called himself a believer, and neither would have anyone else. But it was all he could talk about. He described seeing a bright light, so bright that it scorched his eyes and, he, and caused him to cry out in pain. Most, but most shocking was what happened next. After several seconds of silence, a powerful yet warm and loving voice shook the ground and spoke his name. Ken. He would always pause at this part as if he, the words were still echoing in his ears. Then he would dramatically continue by saying, and then the voice said, I am Jesus, follow me. After that, he said the bright light faded out, and when he opened his eyes, he was in the hospital. His parents, friends, and partners all came to see him when he finally woke up, and he was sure to tell everyone the story. They all found his dream to be quite mysterious, but none of them believed he'd actually met Jesus. At times, uh, as time went on, they tried to reason with him, but he would not be deterred. He was completely convinced he'd met Jesus, and more than that, that he had a responsibility to follow him. While in the hospital, he spent every waking moment, except when he was in rehab, reading the Gideon Bible by his bed. The chaplain visited him daily, and Ken would barrage him with questions based on what he'd read that day. By the time he got released, he'd shared the gospel with every one of his nurses, doctors, and dozens of his fellow patients. Once out, he joined a small church and continued to increase his understanding of the Bible. And he continued to share his newfound faith 
with anyone who'd listen. When he was well enough to return to work, he created such a stir throughout the firm that after only one week, he was pressed by the partners to make a decision. Either stop talking about his faith or stop being a lawyer. Ken's decision was immediate. He quit on the spot. When he got home early on that Monday, Julie was shocked to see him but even more so shocked that he'd given up his lifelong dream, which he'd worked so hard to achieve, and the six-figure income that went with it, for Jesus. She berated him for his foolishness and begged him to give up this madness. Ken refused and instead attempted again to persuade her of God's love and her need to accept Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Julie could tolerate his pious condescension no more. She endured his evangelistic efforts countless times, but this was the last straw. She hurriedly packed a suitcase, blindly throwing clothes into her overnight bag. With tears streaming down her face, she rushed out the door and slammed it behind her, punctuating the end of her patience and their marriage. Ken fell to his knees and cried out to God but not in despair over her rejection of himself, but her rejection of Jesus. Over the next two years, Ken went back to school, but this time to seminary. He attended Nyack College and received a theology degree. Once completed, he followed the promptings of the Lord and traveled from city to city, sharing the gospel on the streets. He would always start in one of the local churches, but many were a suspect of his motives and his message. Very few would support him in his efforts, and some would even treat him quite rudely, accusing him of all kinds of nefarious activities. However, he found in some towns to be friendly and open to his message. Usually the homeless were most open and responsive, but even the wealthy and the educated would on occasion come to hear him. He would stay as long as he felt he was having an impact and as long as he felt the Lord wanted him there. Sometimes he would accumulate large gatherings of people, so much so the community would begin to take notice, including the press. On one occasion, he agreed to an interview with a reporter, but that quickly turned into a personal tax, and they ended up turning the crowd against him. Over the next dozen years, Ken traveled from one city to the next, sharing the gospel as best he could and to as many as possible. During that period, he was arrested many times and spent weeks in jail. The story was always the same. Someone would see him preaching on the street corner and they would call, to the, call the police because they thought he was mentally unstable. A couple of times, a pastor of one of the churches would accuse him of being a huckster and he'd be arrested and then taken to the edge of town. He regularly endured beatings, muggings, imprisonments, and accusations of heresy, sexual abuse, and thievery. One time he was jumped by a group of masked men who beat him unconscious and left him for dead. Ken thought he was dead, but after laying unable to move in a puddle of blood for an hour, he got up and hadn't a bruise on him. He simply returned to the street corner and resumed his preaching. To this day, Ken spends his life living on the streets. He has sacrificed everything to follow Jesus and share his message of love. He gave up his fortune and his career. His family disowned him. His wife divorced him. Most churches reject him, and the society has labeled him an outcast. But he strives to be in tune with God each moment of the day. He sometimes feels pride over the number of souls he's prayed with to receive salvation but he's always careful to give thanks to God who leads, empowers, and cares for him. Despite the daily struggle for food and shelter, he experiences God's love with every bite of food and every dry corner he finds. Each night, as as he pulls his coat over his ears and rests his head on a cardboard pillow, he quietly gives thanks to God for his abundant provision. He even prays for those less fortunate than he. His prayer often goes something like this. Lord, provide for those who have less than I do. For those snuggled in their warm beds, reveal the deception of wealth, comfort, and popularity. May they come to pursue and enjoy 
the depth of your love and provision like I have. Amen. A life like Ken, almost no one in here would look at and say is a life that is being blessed by God. None of us would look at Paul and say, oh yeah, now that's an example for us to follow. But again, the reality is, is that this is the life that Paul lived. And the example that he gives in this chapter about giving up his rights in order to save some is not just an example for the pastors to follow. It's not just an example for the missionaries to follow. This is an example for all Christians to follow. This is the life that we are called to. It's a life of sacrifice, not blessing. Christianity is meant to be a life of surrender. It's all over Scripture. Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 16, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. It's not come follow me and I'm going to dump a whole bunch of cool things on you. It's deny. It's take up your cross. It's sacrifice. It's surrender. And then follow me. Romans 12.1, Paul writes, we are to be living sacrifices in view of God's mercies to offer our bodies as living sacrifices that we would live a life of surrender. John 15.13, the greatest gift that we can give is to lay down our life for a friend. Sacrifice. Even in Acts chapter 4, the the young church is trying to figure things out and those who are poor and struggling and have need are, are taken care of by those with wealth who sell their properties in order to care for them. There's sacrifice everywhere in Scripture. This is the, how our lives as Christians should be defined is by sacrifice, not blessing. Paul ends in this passage with a, a, an imagery of getting in the race. I was uh, in track in high school. I don't know why I did track in high school. I really hate running. <sighs> you know, I wasn't big enough to be a thrower, so guess what that means? I was running. And I, I had to run one of the worst races as well in, in, in the whole track meet, the 400. I had to run two of them every, every, every meet. I'd run the open 400, and at the end of the race, or the end of the meet, I'd have to run the 4x400. Four and it was just brutal. Hated that race. It was horrible. I don't know why I did it, but I did. But one thing I remember about running track is that every time I finished a race, there was a pile of people at the end. Now, some of them were the racers with me because we'd all kind of, you know, stop running at the end and we'd kind of be all grouped together. But some of them were people with stopwatches that had kept our times and were running up to us to tell us what the times were. Some of them were judges who had been there to make sure no one, you know, know, fouled or did anything they weren't supposed to do. But a bunch of them were our fellow athletes, you know, people on our team that were there to congratulate us and to be there for for the end and to, you know, celebrate the end of the race. And then, of course, there were always the people in the stands. We're cheering on everything that was going on up there. And the stands always kind of were on the finish line side, right? You never had them on the other side. Who wants to be over there? They were always on the finish line side. Many of us Christians are in the stands. We're, we're watching from the stands. Yeah, we're cheering on, and we're, at the, we're towards the finish line. We can see what's going on, and we're excited about who's winning. But we're standing in, we're in the stands, and we have no idea what it means for the runners on the race, in the track, right? The run of the race. We have no appreciation for even the sacrifice that goes into it. Now, maybe some of us had run at one point in our lives, and we could have some kind of appreciation. But we have no idea what that individual runner had went through in order to run that race. All the practice that it took to get there, And then the actual, just the battle in the race itself. Some of us are just in the stands. We're not sacrificing anything. We have, we've got no, no skin in the game or nothing. We're just, we're just watching. We're just bystanders. Some of us are fellow athletes, but we're just at the finish line. We're hanging out at the finish line. We just, we just want to be there for the celebration. 
Now, we have some idea of the sacrifice because we were at practices all week, right? So we get that idea a little bit, but we weren't in the race. So don't we know what happened during that? We don't know the battle that was going on in the mind of that runner while they were running. We just want to have that celebration at the end, and so we sit, and we're there, and we're there to celebrate and get all excited about it, but we've never run the race. What Paul is telling us in this passage is that we need to be running the race. In order to run the race, it takes sacrifice. So many of us Christians are sitting in the stands enjoying the blessings of just being an innocent bystander. And we think, those in the stands think that this is it. This is the best. I've got the best seats. Maybe we're right on the finish line. We get to see, you know, that photo finish. We think that's what it's all about. Other of us have have done some sacrificing. We've given some stuff, and it's been difficult, but we're still not in the race. We just jumped right to the end, and we just want to be there for the celebration with those who actually have run the race. But Paul says, look, don't just watch me run. He says, you need to prepare to run the race. You need to sacrifice. And here's the reality. The only ones who can truly celebrate at the finish line are the ones who've run the race. Because they're the only ones that truly understand the sacrifice that it took all week in preparation and the sacrifice that it took and the battle that it took to finish that race that day. See, we have this perspective that Christianity is about blessing and it's about getting the blessing without sacrifice. It is about blessing, but the blessings only come through sacrifice. That we would understand that that the blessings of this world come easy. And God does allow us to enjoy those things at times, but those are just easy things. The heavenly blessings. If we want to experience heaven on earth, then we have to get in the race. We have to sacrifice. We have to be willing to give it up in order to share the love of Christ with someone who's never heard it, never accepted it. The blessings, the true blessings that we long for, are similar to this. In Matthew 5, it talks about this. But when we're poor, we receive riches. When we're poor, we don't just get riches because we're Christians. When we're poor, then we get the riches. When we're sad, then we get the comfort. When we're hungry, then we get the filling. When we're attacked, then we get the strength. When we're insulted, then we get the affirmation. When we're dead, then we get the resurrection. Have you confused earthly blessing with heavenly one? Are you content with just getting the earthly blessings? Have you elevated the earthly blessings to make yourself feel like you're more spiritual? Is Christianity about blessing or sacrifice for you? And we're talking real sacrifice. Not sacrifice out of our abundance. Sacrifice that costs us. The widow's might. She gave more than anyone else, Jesus says. She gave it all. That offering was not just like, oh, here, I've got a couple extra coins I'm going to throw in. That was all she had. She had no idea what tomorrow was going to bring. She had no idea where the food was going to come, how she was going to survive. But she knew that she needed to sacrifice. And she did. She gave it all. What about you? Is Christian life about blessing or sacrifice? Are you in the stands? Are you at the finish line? Are you in the race? Being in the race is all about sacrifice. That's how we train, and that's how we compete. There's no place like the middle of a race to find out where our weaknesses lie. But there's also nowhere, any place except for in the middle of a race where we experience the true power and blessing of God. 
worship team, if you could please come forward. This is just one final thought. May we be a church filled with runners. Runners who know true and painful sacrifice. Runners who have experienced true testing. But also runners who are able to enjoy true celebration. It's the runners in the race that can enjoy the celebration. The entrance into the race is sacrifice. What is God calling you to sacrifice in order to get in the race and enjoy His amazing provision?